Layer 2 Publishing presents The Source, Anora Fireborn, Book 1, written by Arlo Adams, narrated by Kelsiano Dowd and Brian Mesler. Preface The following communique was sent to customers who pre-ordered the VMMO RPG Anora Online, June 26, 2051. A note to all the fans of Light of Babylon from President and CEO of Infinity Designs, Nakuro Takamoto. Hey, VMGers. This week, I wanted to reach out to the faithful players of Light of Babylon just in time for our 20th anniversary celebration to address the rumor mill in the wake of the gameplay video we released last week. While we expected a massive response, our players once again exceeded our expectations with over 25 million pre-orders of the upcoming title. Enora Online. As with any anticipated release, the webosphere is alight with speculation, and boy, we've heard some real doozies. While I admit how entertained I am to follow the various message boards to hear you all guess at just what you saw, who the player in the video was, and myriad other wildness, I think it's prudent to douse a few incorrect guesses that have caught fire. Yes, Enora Online is a fully immersive, virtual, massively multiplayer online role-playing game like Light of Babylon. But no, that doesn't mean we're shutting down LOB just yet. For those of you who want to continue your second lives in that virtual world, we have no plans to retire at any time soon. Now that we've set that aside, let's address some unauthorized leaks surrounding Enora Online that have popped up. First of all, it's true that Enora Online has been in development for many years. It's also true its AI served as the foundation for a new technology we're developing that will allow people with terminal illnesses to live in virtual worlds. Yes, it's an amazing change for the human race, and we're quite proud of what we're doing in partnership with nations around the world. Although we wanted to allow for some measure of privacy to the players shown in the game footage, a recent leak that he was one of these terminally ill people we used as a guinea pig in testing the new technology have made it difficult to do so. Although we disagree with the characterization, the rest is true. The person pictured contracted Lubrin's autoimmune syndrome. He was a player of Light of Babylon for years who had displayed exceptional skills, and I had the crazy idea that putting someone like that in a game world to test its latest iteration was a perfect way to test the consciousness transfer while saving a life. A win-win. Besides, Gemini was a hell of a guy, and I didn't want to see him dead. Blunt? Well... When have you ever known me to be anything else? It was never our intention to let people transfer their consciousnesses into a virtual game world, but Anora was the world we had ready, and Gemini, who gave me permission to share his gamer tag once I told him the cat was out of the bag, was more than willing. Given the choice of that or death, who wouldn't be? While I won't go into details about Gemini's experiences in Anora, we've commissioned Arlo Adams to write the books. Suffice it to say, he's had a hell of a time. I digress. Needless to say, the testing was a massive success. We designed Anora Online to be more than just an immersive experience. We wanted it to be a lifestyle away from life. Gemini has proven we reached that goal. But we ran into some bumps along the way, and the recent leaks made some of those public. I will address only one. Yes, when the AI became self-aware, there were significant issues to overcome. As it is the first known entity of its kind to achieve consciousness, there was no roadmap to follow, no documented solutions to implement. But we successfully scoured every line of code, every algorithm. While I will not confirm nor deny any of the rumors nor go into further detail about our proprietary technology, I can assert with confidence that all issues involving the AI have been addressed, bugs crushed underfoot, and that the source of the leaks has been extricated from Infinity Designs. Enora Online is coming. Now, it's my pleasure to announce the system at the heart of Enora Online that will change the way you view immersive gaming. Real NPC technology. You see, in Enora Online, NPCs aren't coded by our developers. They're born just like you and I. They're products of their memories, just like us. They have parents and have formed cultures across their massive planet, much like we have on ours. In fact, Here's a little tidbit that will get the juices flowing. What would you think if I told you we fast-forwarded the world 2,000 years to watch it evolve? What if I told you it exceeded our expectations beyond our wildest imaginings? Well, we did. And it did. 
and Gemini testified to its greatness. When I offered him the opportunity to move to one of our non-gaming test worlds, where he could live and work virtually with the outside world, he told me to go do things to myself that I won't repeat here. He loves Enora, and I think you will too. Just wait until you see the real, living, breathing NPCs whose lineages are the products of parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, and so on. NPCs who run markets, developed and mastered trade crafts, and yes, adventured against evil for 2,000 years. Each continent across this expansive world has developed its own political systems. Trust me when I say you'll be amazed. If that's not enough, wait until you see our completely adaptive real-time quest engine. That's right, no static quests. Your quests will be given based on real-time events as they unfold. And that's not all. Enora boasts an adaptive magic and combative abilities engine like nothing else. What if you could use a magic system to develop your own twists on spells and melee combat abilities? Thanks to our latest content patch, you can. You might even encounter NPCs who've tapped into this new discovery. But to see it in action, you'll have to log in and check it out. There's no way to describe Enora to an outsider. You have to experience it. The video was just the beginning. And two weeks from today, six weeks in Oren time, we're going to unleash you on the world. Watch this space for more updates. And thanks in advance for ordering the most realistic VMMORPG ever conceived. Enora Online. Chapter 1 The front door exploded. Flames licked up the frame as it split from its hinges then crashed to the floor. Loose boards creaked beneath my father's heavy footfalls when he circled the wood stove. After his fingers locked onto my shoulders, he shook me. We'll have to go out the back. Grab your coat. My heartbeat thumped in a rapid tempo with such force I feared it might explode from my chest. Baba swept a hand toward the wall nearby. Armor. To me. He claimed the curved squares of metal were elven art. Now they were a protective barrier that shivered then burst from their shelves. My coat hung limp in my hands as the silvery slivers zipped through the air then attached to his shoulders, his back, and his arms until they formed snug silver armor. Class flipped and clicked to lock the pieces together. My jaw dropped at the sight of my father clad in the heavy armor like some kind of warrior from the stories he told me as a child. Who was this man? Surely not the one who toiled in the fields beside me since I stood on my own two feet. Not he who'd cradled me in his arms when I woke screaming from my sleeping terrors. But you're a farmer. The licking flames crackled as they climbed the door jamb, then stretched toward the ceiling, but Baba acted as if he didn't hear them, and as if I hadn't spoken. I jerked when he stomped atop the worn rug in the center of the floor. His booted foot shoved it into a wavy pile before he kicked the end of a loose floorboard. When it popped up, he yanked it free, tossed it aside, then reached into the recess. He pulled out a leather sheath laden with embossed symbols and a long sword of shining silver with a golden pommel. But you're a farmer! The sword swept the air before him as he tested its weight. His gaze finally found me. Do you have your blade? Although I reached down to pat the sheath attached to my belt, my hand touched only the fabric of my hanging coat. With a frustrated grunt, I slung it over the other shoulder, slipped my arm into it, then patted the knife handle. I have it. How many times had he chastised me for being outside without it? I peered through the rear window before opening the door. Multitudes of orange-skinned humanoids with pointed ears burst over the snowy hillside and streamed toward our farm. Baba, they're out here too. I hadn't called him that aloud in ages. The words sounded childish to my own ears. I can't fight them with my knife. The back door swung open. My father clutched my shoulder for the second time. He cast a desperate gaze from inches away, his warm breath contrasting the cold wind blowing in from outside. His words rattled off in clipped syllables. There'll be no fighting for you, little miss. Get to the barn, mount up, ride hard. You know how to survive. If our bond breaks, you'll receive a message in your mind window. Do not come back. You must find a man named Drassen Welling. He will train you. Do everything you can to advance your skills. Skills?
skills? What skills? Why would I become unbound? But I knew how stupid the second question was the moment the word slipped past my lips. He squeezed my shoulder until it ached. Just know, Contessa, everything we did was for good reason. Who is we? Who is Drossen Welling? Training for what? If I fall, find him. He often visits Warrington. No matter how long it takes, you must seek him out. Training? Two demons burst through the burning door at the opposite end of the house. Father wheeled, swept his blade around in a two-handed grip, then swung it in a brutal arc. The blade sliced through one of the demons' heads. Then he brought it around and down in a smooth motion that split the other's face vertically in two halves. I clapped a hand over my mouth as he raised his boot, shoved it against the orange-skinned monster's chest, then kicked it away. His sword slid free with a sickening slurp. Green blood dripped in rivers. To the barn, Contessa. You must go. I will hold them off. He yanked me forward and squeezed with his free hand. I'm sorry, Tess. You'll understand someday. His lips pressed against my forehead in a gentle kiss as they had a million times before. But as invaders swept over the hillside and sprinted toward our farmhouse, my stomach rolled in realization this would be the last. When he released me, I clutched the cold metal covering his plated arm and leveled my gaze on him. I don't care, Baba. Whatever you did, I will never hold it against you. He cupped my cheek. You've blossomed into a fine young woman, Tess. You have a good soul, but hear me. He leaned in, his burnt sienna eyes gleaming. You will learn things about yourself. The powerful would exploit them. Trust no one until you find Dross and Welling. Promise me. What things? There's no time. Do you understand? I nodded. My heart pounded against my ribs when he shoved me into the onslaught of snow and wind, but I sped for the barn, determined that if my father would fall, it would happen with his knowledge that my last act was in obedience. My boot caught, plunging me into the frigid powder. Despite the howling wind, the shrill screams of the low creatures filled the air. There must have been fifty of the low beasts bearing down on us, so I barely noticed the frosty numbness on the flesh of my palms when I planted them in the deep snow to rise. Back on my feet I trudged forward, high-stepping, attention locked on the double barn doors, praying to the goddess I would make it. A scream brought my head around to find a few breaking away from the pack in my direction. A glance at my father over one shoulder proved to be a mistake as I lost my footing and tumbled again. The closer the demons came, the brighter their eyes glowed. A harsher, deep howl filled the air. I pushed onto my knees, then twisted in search of its source. My father stood with his arms spread out wide, grasping his sword in one hand as a shockwave of brilliant white light whipped in all directions, dispersing a layer of snow along its trajectory. When the beams slammed into the demons nearest me, they slid to a halt, turned, then charged toward my baba. But he's a farmer, the pouty voice of my inner child moaned inside my head. Just a farmer is all. His sword swung in wide arcs to drive back the horde. Despite my fear, I winked my eyes in succession, the same way I did to read a document in my library of tomes he'd purchased for my education in towns to the northwest, the same one I used to check the durability of my blade to see if it required sharpening. Terashan the Mighty, level 60 Blade Master, melee power rating 120, melee defense rating 111, ranged power rating 43, ranged defense rating 81, magic power rating 1, magic defense rating 7, magic resistance rating 4. My father was a level 90 farmer, yet my mind window spun this lie. More likely your mind cast lies for your comfort. Move. I crawled through the snow as he unleashed majestic violence upon the invaders. Green turrets of blood painted the pristine whiteness as an orange head plopped into the deep powder before vanishing. Hunched demons formed a semicircle around Baba, arms stretched out to their sides, long black claws extended as they measured for an opening. They took turns lurching toward him, then withdrawing, 
Although he didn't turn his head, my father must have sensed me there, for he bellowed a last command. Go, Tess! I snapped out of my disbelief, got my feet under me, nearly tumbled again as I fled. More of those horrible screams filled the air as I flipped the latch, yanked open the door, then hustled inside. The saddle struggled against my efforts to free it from its rack, even though I'd performed the motion hundreds of times. My quaking hands refused to cooperate as I shook its awkward weight, uttered words the goddess would have frowned upon. With the other hand, I tugged so hard on the bridle, the spike on which it hung splintered the wood. Our horse grumbled when I approached with the gear, probably sensing the danger nearby, but he didn't fight me on getting the bit into his mouth as I slipped the bridle on and buckled it. I risked another glance through the open bar door to spy three demons charging through the heavy snowfall in my direction. Every moment spent preparing the horse was laden with dread. Eyes squeezed shut, I cast a final plea into the universe. Please, Solara, protect my father, or let this all be a dreadful dream. But when I looked again, the evil minions drew closer. Unsure if I'd have time to get out in one piece, I grabbed a rake that leaned against the stable wall crammed it into the saddle's tool loop Baba had installed where I could easily reach it from atop my mount, then shoved one foot into the stirrup. Once mounted, I gripped the pommel. Tippy burst out of the stable, shot around the corner, then carried us away. A head check revealed Baba fought on, meeting each invader with the hard thrust of his sword. He spun in a circle, his weapon shining with white energy before cutting through a line of demons like a fire-heated poker through snow. A black figure towering over the surrounding army sauntered into view from the corner of the burning house, throwing his arms out in both directions. The minions scurried away. Then the unknown enemy turned its head. The thickness of the falling snow created a sheet my gaze could barely penetrate, but his red eyes glowed through it. He raised a finger in my direction, then the demon horde burst forth. Their short legs launched them high aloft, and as soon as the powder puffed into plumes where they landed, they jumped again. Beyond them, the Dark One reached out, grasped the blade of my father's sword, then ripped it from his grasp. The sheer force of his strength pulled Baba forward onto his knees. No. The demon thrust the sword into my father's chest, raised him high overhead in a sweeping arc, then slammed him down head first. No! I screamed. No, Baba! Golden lines zipped across the outer edges of my field of vision to draw a square. The golden frames thickened, then the mind window I'd once used for schooling and instruction on planting and harvesting flashed a message. Your soul bond to Tarish on the Mighty has been broken. Suppression removed. Combat progression unlocked. Magic proficiencies unlocked. World map activated. A blue bar materialized beneath my health meter in the top left portion of my mind window, just beneath the one with the red liquid representing my life force. My eyes widened when it filled from the left and flowed to the right. In the wake of your father's demise, you have been offered a legacy quest. Find Drossen Welling. Seek out Drossen Welling somewhere in Rubal. Reward, 1,500 XP. Do you accept this quest? Yes. No. Another howl brought my head around, and after accepting the strange invitation, I cast off the remaining system messages with a thought. The lesser demons leapt through the air, closing faster than I'd imagined possible. Tears froze to my face in the frigid breeze. Beyond the heavy snowfall, my pursuer's eyes glowed brighter with each impossible stride. My thighs burned as they gripped the saddle. The bones in my fingers crackled as I struggled to maintain my grip on the pommel. How I longed to loose my knife and impale them all. But these were dreams of vengeance only a girl would entertain, and I was a seventeen-year-old woman. Despite my father's demise, I would not waste his sacrifice with fantasies. Another glance revealed they'd soon be on us and I would face a similar end if I didn't act. The closest demon launched, its outstretched claw raking my mount's tail. Tippy frog-hopped, reared onto his hind legs, then hustled up a hill toward a thicket of trees. We'll never make it. Then I remembered the rake. I dropped the reins. Although my hands struggled against my intent in the freezing cold, I freed the farm tool-turned weapon from its leather loop, then swung it around just as a demon landed on Tippy's thick backside. My back protested about the unnatural way I had to twist to swing, but the tines lodged into the demon's head before sending it reeling through the air as the horse carried us into the thicket. 
The demon slammed into a tree, causing a plume of frosty powder to burst forth. You have defeated a level 6 lower demon, plus 337 XP. 50% bonus for defeating an enemy 5 levels higher. Congratulations, you have reached level 2. Since you have not chosen a class, your attribute points will be assigned to Constitution, plus 2 Constitution. You are awarded one elective attribute point. You must visit a trainer to spend this point. The message faded when I focused on another jumping demon, and as I raised the rake, hoping to push him back before he landed, the metal head was gone. It had lodged itself into my first victim, leaving only a stick to defend us. I growled. Then I'll use a stick. But Tippy turned while the demon soared through the air, so the attacker rolled in the snow as we charged into the thicket. The horse wheeled again in the opposite direction, zigzagging. The demon slowed their pursuit as they dipped and dodged around the trees. I lowered my head close to Tippy's neck and patted him firmly. Go, baby. We can do this. The steed wound through the timbers like it had been born among them, and when we came out the other side of the thicket, the demons had fallen far enough behind to be out of view. But that would change when they reached the open tundra, and the jets of steam pluming from my aging horse's nostrils reminded me he had limits. Tippy pulled a plow. He wasn't a racer. His hooves gave off a muffled clatter as we topped an incline. We'd found the snow-covered, rough road Baba used to travel north. Other farms of Gynus and Milbury Peaks would line this stretch for twenty miles, but not until I reached the distant base of the nearest mountain. The horse's pace slowed as Tippy's breaths came in harsh gusts, sides heaving under my legs. I cast a look over my shoulders to find the demons exiting the thicket. They'd be on us in minutes. I eyed the dips on either side of the road when our pursuers disappeared behind a low hill. Sliding the rake handle into the cylinder, I patted my horse's neck a final time. Stride on, boy. Don't stop. The reach to the buckle was long, but I eventually snatched it with my hands. The strap slid free of the ring, the saddle slipped to one side, then I floated through space as Tippy's hooves clopped away in the blinding snow.